Assalamu alaikum uh, to all of our viewers watching, um, watching now or watching later. Uh, thank you so much for always joining us. Your support um, absolutely catalyzes the work that we do here at MPAC and, and really keeps us going during this time. Um, you are such a loyal advocate to our cause and, and we cannot thank you enough. With that in mind, um, speaking of causes, I know that many of us are celebrating a very sacred and holy month of Ramadan um, this month, and we here at MPAC hope that your fasts have been very healthy and safe and, and fruitful, um, and may you keep us in your du'as as you are always in ours. Um, I encourage each of you, if you have not yet seen our Ramadan Mubarak video, we had a host of congressional leaders, leaders in tech, um, leaders from the Hollywood, leaders from Hollywood, would um, join in this cause of uplifting Muslim Americans, uplifting Ramadan, and sharing their solidarity in, in quarantine, um, in, in this time of quarantine. So please check it out. Uh, we have it all over our Instagram at MPAC National, um, on our Facebook. So please, please um, keep an eye out for, for further uh, digital outreach as well. With that in mind, um, welcome to another webinar of Coping in Quarantine. We have a very exciting guest today um, to talk about one of everyone's favorite topics right now, money. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about the economic impact of COVID-19. Our guest is the wonderful, wonderful Saad Zarif of Wahed Invest. Um, I'm going to, to introduce Saad just, to, just briefly because I want to get to ask as many questions as possible, but Saad is the Vice President of the North of North America at Wahed Invest and is responsible for client acquisition, retention, product growth, and educating clients about financial literacy. During his career, Saad worked in private equity where he is responsible for raising series of funding from credited investors for startups in the biotechnology sector. He has also advised financial advisors on asset allocation and advisor shares and worked as a trader for a Wall Street brokerage firm. Saad received his undergraduate in accounting from the London School of Management. So please, please utilize this resource. We have um, a question and answer portion that we will um, be utilizing in um, Zoom as well as Facebook Live. So ask your questions away um, because I know I, I have I have plenty. Um, I'm going to pass the torch over to our president, Mr. Salamo Mariotti, to kind of get the ball rolling with Saad and then we'll head back to, to Q&A shortly. Thank you, man. Uh, Salam alaikum, everybody, and Ramadan Mubarak to uh, all of you as we're approaching the, the first uh, the end of the first week of Ramadan, and I hope that you are gaining tremendously from uh, this blessed month. Um, and, uh, and doing it in quarantine, uh, actually, to us, uh, it's a lot like the, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. He, he prayed at home, he fasted at home, he, he uh, broke fast at home, and uh, maybe this is meant to be, uh, at least for one year, where we can... Uh, embrace solitude uh, and uh, stillness to increase our faith, and may may uh, God continue to bless you to increase your faith. Uh, as Iman said, we have a very special guest, uh, Saad Zari from Wahed Investments, and a lot of our community uh, uh, side uh, they are part of the small business community. They they don't, you know their their businesses are shut down, um, and they're thinking about what they do for their businesses. But before we get into that, um, uh, well, let me ask you, is bankruptcy an option? And if, if so, should small businesses consider that right now? Hey, Salam Alaikum. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor to be speaking with you guys. I know MPAC is doing some absolutely amazing work that I follow pretty closely. So kudos to you guys for what you do um, in all of this. And Ramadan work to everyone. Um, <laughs> You know what, in order to answer the question, the first thing that one should ask themselves is, what's their pain point when it comes to money? There's actually a question I usually ask in most of my talks that I give, and I usually pop up a slide, um, and I usually ask people, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you see this? And the letters are written M-O-N-E-Y, money. People give me all sorts of different answers. Oh, I'd like to buy whatever I can. The savvier ones will use technical terms like purchasing power which is a fancy way of saying I can buy whatever I want because I have money in the bank. Um, so whatever answer you give related to money is actually a direct correlation to how you emotionally feel about money. 
So to your point about bankruptcy as well and what we are going through, what people should first do is check their emotions. I know for a fact that I'm emotionally attached to my money, so am I making a rational or irrational decision? More often than less, in my experience of working in the industry for 16 years, very rarely I've seen people make rational decisions during turmoil. When the markets are doing well, everyone's happy, everyone's putting money in, nobody's complaining. The moment something happens, everyone freaks out. We've seen this time and time again. I started my career in 2007 in New York on Wall Street, and I experienced the 09 market crash firsthand. Um, from then now until January, the market gave over 490% return. So the one that were patient and waited along won. This is unprecedented what's happened. And it's important to put a bit of color on that for some of those that don't realize the gravity of what we're in. The economy was doing extremely well. There was nothing wrong with the economy up until January, February. This is a forced halt to that. It, it's not like banks needed bailout like they did in 08. It's not like people were defaulting on mortgages. We actually live in a very classic um, gig economy now. You can be doing a full-time job and be an Uber driver, work for DoorDash, do something online and still make money. So you have more than one avenue of earning money. And, and so that is still doable. People that are currently able to make some money are those that are actually doing restaurant delivery, for example, or doing DoorDash who were Uber drivers, for instance. Um, so, so you have means of making that, but to your point, when it comes to bankruptcy, you need to look at the broader situation right now. If you're a business A that works with vendor B, well, your vendor is also in trouble right now. The supply chain is broken. It's a very common term that's on like all channels right now that people are talking about. Hey, the supply chain is broken. Restaurants can't get the food in. Grocery stores are not getting the meat in. What are we going to do? So when you're going to talk about bankruptcy, I always suggest take a step back. And again, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. I'm actually an accountant by profession that fell in love with capital markets and ended up working in this space. No, nothing against auditors. I just can't be that dry. I'm like, kudos to you guys who are auditors out there. That's pretty awesome work. Um, so ask yourself three questions, I would say, when you're thinking about bankruptcy. Number one, how urgent is my current situation? That do I need to do it or not? Number two, shop around. Talk to at least two or three bankruptcy attorneys get your options weighed. Because remember, once you file for bankruptcy, you're looking at eight years until when you can't do it again. So, and also realize, like I said, looking at your surroundings, trying to be less emotional about your money and your business and being logical to say, um, can I wait on this or not? Can I wait this out? We have over 22 million people that are unemployed right now. These were the numbers up until two weeks ago. Um, it's funny, I spoke to someone today who's a business owner and he said, I got the PPP, PPE loan, but my employees are not willing to come back. About 30 of them. I said, why? He said, well, they're actually making more money through their unemployment benefit than they were working with me. I was like, you stingy bugger. But that's okay, he probably yeah. wasn't. Um, it's more about the reality of things right now that we're in. Some people are probably making more money they are through unemployment than they were when they were employed. What's the guarantee they're going to come back? Um, so there are lots of moving parts with it. So bankruptcy is a very sort of serious subject matter, should not be taken lightly. Recognize that you are surrounded by people that are probably in similar situation as you, including the supply chain that's linked to your business as well. So shop around, take a deep breath, see if it's urgent or not urgent enough. Once you file, what are the repercussions of it for your business as well? Um, so Irrational versus rational can help you make the best decision moving forward. But most certainly these days, there are lots of flexibility even from courts about bankruptcy as well. I know a few attorneys that are involved in it. Uh, you don't have to be in person at the court. You can do it all online. Um, but, but make sure you first of all understand what's the bare necessity of doing that. Speak to two, three attorneys at least. Weigh out your option and then see if you can wait it out or not though. Because this hopefully will not last forever. But again, it's something that came so much as a surprise to us. We don't know when it's going to end. So we need to prepare accordingly. You know, I, I watched this video. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, it, it. It made the rounds on Twitter about this, this gentleman who said, why can't banks just extend our, uh, our loans by three months and, you know, defer it three months uh, instead of making us uh, either suffer through not being able to pay or paying that and then not having enough money for other things like food and, and other necessities. 
why can't banks do that? Why can't they say, this is a special moment in history. We're just going to push pause. And that way people don't have to worry about mortgage or rent or utilities right now. You're absolutely right. And I wish there was a straightforward answer, but there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy involved there. Um, what I will say is that Mark Cuban actually recently wrote about this. He worked with a local bank, I believe out of Oklahoma, where the CEO of the bank said, we are going to give people an overdraft facility. Instead of giving you a complete break, we'll give you an overdraft facility and say, use this money now while you're applying for a loan or for financial backing to delay things. Um, I think overall banks are obviously looking at their, at their interest first, no matter what. Even when you put money in, an, in, an, in a bank account, that money is not sitting still. That's being used by the bank to leverage it and make income off it as well. Um, I spent a bit of time working at Morgan Stanley where I was a wealth manager, basically. And the biggest thing always was, are you putting the client's interest first or the bank's interest first? Unfortunately, more, more often than less, the bank wants to think about themselves first. Even in these situations, if you work, if you're part of a small bank, let's say not Bank of America, JP Morgan, but perhaps a smaller one, talk to your bank manager about this. These days, a lot of people are showing signs of empathy that they probably didn't do before. Even banks are still have that sort of quota to fill where they want to keep their accounts there. They don't want to lose their business as well because you have so many choices out there. They may be able to come up with something that may give you a bit of a grace period in that. Um, same thing to your point about rent. Um, in the CARES Act, there's nothing forcing landlords not to do, but it's also forcing them to say, hey, for up to 60 days or, or so, you cannot kick your tenant out if they're not paying you rent. So you have a benefit there. And then speak with your landlord, whether it's a property agency or an individual by saying, hey, this is the situation I'm in, man, right now. If I can't pay at the moment, can you give me a two, three month grace period and then we can start a payment plan of sorts for a while thing, until things go back to normal. Everyone wants something out of this situation. If I'm a landlord and my tenants can't pay me rent, if I can get something out of them in a month or two, I'll take that rather than completely losing them. Because remember, in this day and age right now, no one wants to lose a tenant. They're going to find it hard to refill that place right now. So I think as a tenant, you could be at a benefit here by thinking about, hey, how can this be of an advantage to me? All right, I'm going to go and have a chat with my landlord, talk to him about my situation, make sure he understands because everyone does right now, and then see, okay, how can we fix that? As far as if the bank in itself is concerned, if you have a relationship manager at the bank, if you're someone that often goes to your bank to do your business, see who you can talk to there and what they can come up with. Banks will never advertise that, hey, I'm gonna give you a free break for 90 days, but they may be able to do something while you're sitting there with them face to face perhaps to do you a favor to keep your business alive as well. All comes down to relationship building there. So uh, let's say that, you know, you, you mentioned Mark Cuban, uh, who's the owner of the National Basketball mm -hmm. Association team, the Dallas Mavericks, and he's a billionaire. Yeah. And uh, I think he's also featured in Shark Tank and. Yep. Things like that. Um, he said uh, something very interesting. He said, we, we need to start thinking of solutions that are bottom up, not top down. In 2008, it was about bailing out the banks and the financial sector and, and then re, uh, reinitiating the economy from there. But he's saying we should do it differently this time. Do you agree? A hundred percent. Coming from a Wall Street pedigree trained individual who then realized that all of that was more of a hoopla than anything else because it benefits the pocket of those investment bankers rather than the average Joe who wants to invest their money, watch it grow to benefit them, their families and their future. The top down is where you look at someone that's most important to the least. Bottom up is what's our general concerns of the general public right now? How can we help them first help small businesses that cater to our local state, to our local economy, and then go after these uh, hedge fund managers or billionaires who have money to sustain themselves and their businesses, why should they get the bailout money? Why should they get over 150 billion that Mnuchin is working on right now, for example, and support them as well and not just the small businesses in the first place for that matter? Um, I completely agree with that. And I think that is the kind of philosophy we perhaps eventually want to introduce to recognize the fact that it's not always the survival of the fittest or the survival of the most successful one, but anyone that's putting in the effort to keep that economic cycle running can actually benefit from this. Now, let's go to the, to the, uh, to the average person, to, to Main Street here. What should people do um, in terms of uh, their current uh, money, their savings? Should, 
should they invest in the stock market? Should they pay off debts? Should they just continue to save and, and keep it in their bank accounts? Uh, that's a great question. Again, it comes down to, to a bunch of things. Number one, ask yourself, how often do you go out on a date with your finances? When was the last time you sat with a cup of chai, cup of tea, cup of coffee, and just looked at your finances for 30 minutes? That's one minute a day. That's all you need, quite honestly, if you learn how to manage your finances to say, okay, I'm at home, not working right now. Perhaps you are working remotely, still getting your salary. Maybe you've had to take a reduction in your salary. A lot of banks and institutions had to do that, um, you know, to, to help support and sustain the business. Um, and then you look at yourself and say, okay, where am I spending more? Where am I spending less? For me, right now, my groceries have gone up. But then my gas is really low. I'm barely driving around. Even gas in itself has come down in value. When I do grocery shopping, I get points that I can use towards my gas as well, for example. So that difference, what am I doing with that money? Um, to the point of debt versus investments, always look at your debt first. If you have large amount of debt that cannot wait, work on paying that off first. Rule of thumb used to be, have three to six months of capital or cash saved in a bank account that you can live off. Nowadays, it should be eight to 12 months, I think even because you just never know what's going to happen with you. We're living in really unique times where human beings were evolving, illnesses, diseases are evolving, turning into things like COVID-19. So when, you, when it comes to understanding money, make sure that you're in touch and in tune with your pain point about how to manage the difference between your needs and your wants. I want to go on a lavish holiday. I want to go to Bora Bora. I want to buy a fancy car. Um, and my need is to make sure I have a roof over my head, I pay my mortgage, I pay my bills, and I clear my debts, and then invest. The difference between saving and investing uh, is really based off knowing how much to save for a rainy day versus investing the residual money on top of that. Because if, if it's sitting still, it's not going to do much for you. And to put that in perspective from a saving and investing point of view, um, 2007, when I moved to New York, I was, prior to that, I was working in Spain. I was in Barcelona for a couple of years, working for a private equity firm. My cousin took me out and said, I need to take you to the best place ever to eat. This place is called Halal Guys. It's a card food place, and you're going to enjoy this food. I paid for a combination platter with a drink, $5. Today, that will cost you about $10.99, maybe 11 bucks, I think. So that has already doubled in value in 12 years' time. So if you're hardcore sitting in cash and holding cash, it's actually losing value for you over time. However, coming to your point, if you're smart with your money management and you're going out on a date with your finances, even for a minute a day, 30 minutes total, you should be able to dissect and say, okay, which are most important debts that I need to pay off first? And then I can look into investing. To your point about investing now, there's no perfect time to invest in the stock market. There's never a good time, there's never a bad time. There might be a bad situation in the market, but there's a term called market risk that I talk about a lot, which means there's a risk in the stock market every time you invest. The value can go up, the value can go down. But it's only realized if you collect those losses. So, so to a lot of people right now, it's a great opportunity because the market is actually somewhat starting to turn around because we are accepting the new norm that we're around. We have accepted the fact that we're working from home. This is how life could be until the foreseeable future. It's become a norm, but the markets are not susceptible to it that much anymore. If you have money, definitely look into investing as well, as long as it's not taking food off the table. But do look at still clearing off your debt. Coming to debts, very quickly, I want to cover. A lot of different plans are out there that can benefit you. If you have student debts, the U.S. has what? I think about 44.2 million um, sort of Americans that have student debt right now. Interest rates are close to 0%. Take advantage of that. Shop around for student loans. See if you can kind of refinance your loans at a low interest rate as well. That can give you a bit of a buffer also. So, so keeping those things in mind can actually be very, very beneficial. How, how Can you tell us more about refinancing student loans? Because a lot of us have kids and we're paying off the loans at 6 7% uh, at this point. Yeah, I know. It's insanely high. So I actually did that for my own personal mortgage, for example. And I'll share this. My interest rate on my mortgage in November happened to be 3.75% on 30 years. For 30 years now, I can get it for 3.25%. So when you shop around, you look at different banks and institutions that give out student loans. I think there's a website called debt, D-E-B-T.com. 
Um, independent website, really great. They have a whole section on student financing as well. Um, and quite honestly, there's so much online information available. If you literally just Google search student debt refinancing, you'll find different institutions that specialize in refinancing student loans, federal or state, depending on which ones they can cover for you. So to your point, yeah, if you're paying a high interest rate for your kids or your kids are doing it for themselves and you want them to be financially independent as soon as, taking advantage of that to shop around and see, hey, who else can I take my loan to to see if they can refinance it? Or do something that one of my cousins did when we were chit-chatting a while back. And she said, well, I've, I, can, I have this option to get like a, an interest-free loan from my bank that's willing to give me. And I can pay that off in X number of months, say $15,000 over 10 years, for example, or five years. But that will reduce my monthly cost that I'm paying towards my student debt if I pay that off lump sum and slowly pay this off interest-free. So it all comes down to how much your student debt is. If it's only a few thousand dollars, you can look for alternatives like interest-free credit cards, for example. Maybe pay it off completely and then pay the credit card in installment might be lower for you. Uh, or different banks and institutions that offer you uh, refinancing on student loans, shop around again. Right now, it's a great opportunity to shop around and see, hey, where can I find a better fit probably? What about our 401ks and you know changes? Is, is it time to pull back on that because the, the market is so volatile? And then uh, there, are there other options in terms, in, in terms of investments? Absolutely. Um, there are always options, markets are. So think of it this way. What is volatility when people ask? Does everyone know what volatility is here? It's this, the way my hand is moving. This is called fluctuation in the market price. This is also called market playing with your emotions, which is your money. Um, to your point, what should you do with your 401k? First of all, reach out to your plan administrator. That's a fancy term for a financial advisor, basically, that is associated with your 401k. Pick their brain. Uh, figure out how long are you investing for. 401ks are designed for retirement. They're not resigned, re defined or established for short-term investing. So if you're someone in your 20s and 30s, you have two, three decades ahead of you before you even touch that money, ideally. 59 and a half is the age in the US before which you can take out, before which if you take out money, you'll pay penalties and taxes on it. Even though CARES Act has some flexibility there that I'm personally, I don't see much value in it unless you're someone that's about to retire. Should you rebalance your 401k? Absolutely. What does rebalance mean? Keeping it in the investment bucket you've selected. If you're someone that is aggressive in nature, you think like a teenager, you believe you're many years ahead of you, you're only investing in stocks, then you want to stay to it. If you're doing stocks and bonds, 70% in stocks, 30% in bonds, um, you want to make sure it stays in that bucket. So at Wired Invest, where I work, we are a Sharia compliant investment firm. So we don't use conventional bonds, we use Sukuk, which are Islamic bonds. We have diversified portfolios built based on different risk levels that people can take, and they invested based on that, all online done and managed for you. But with your 401k, it, it's your nest egg, it's the money you're gonna rely on when you retire. So even when things are volatile, there are opportunities there. Speak to the financial advisor and find out that, hey, what's beneficial for me? Should I rebalance it and maybe tweak a little bit? Some, in some cases, the advisor might say, yes, you should. In other cases, they may say, no, you should not, you're really young right now, you have another two decades ahead of you, you will experience volatility, don't worry about it. So that's based on your situation. If you're someone in your 50s or 60s that is about to retire or has retired, you should ideally not be aggressive. And if you are, that's all on you because you're willing to take that risk. If you're moderate or conservative, and by that I mean more into bonds, less into stocks, because you want to reduce that volatility that we were talking about, then that's what you should be doing. So keeping an eye on your 401k is really important just like your personal finances, but you don't have to obsess over it. We have a tendency to obsess over money. We don't even realize it, especially when it comes to stocks and shares. So always have a core strategy and a satellite strategy. Your core strategy is with a professional, your 401k. Maybe you have an investment account with Wired or somewhere else, for example, that's being managed professionally. Your satellite is where you're trading on your own, maybe through Robinhood or something. Play money that you're willing to risk as well. Uh, but, but, to, to sum up your question about the 401k, speak to the local financial advisor first of all, because everyone's situation is different based off your age and what you're investing in, how much company match you're getting or you're not, and how far you are from retirement and what goals you have that you want to achieve for it.
Because remember, no matter what goals you set for your investment return, they're dynamic, just like your life is. It's dynamic. It fluctuates and changes over time. So will your goals. What about the precious, precious metals options like gold and, and uh, uh, other uh, things like that? Isn't that an option as opposed to trying to work with the stock market? Oh, both are. I mean, it's all about diversification, right? You, you can't just stick to one thing only and hope that that's going to work for you. It will for a short while, but it may not forever. Hence, what we use in, in the industry, the term is diversify. And that's what we sort of preach at Wahid Invest to our clients that diversify your investments. Definitely commodities are great, especially gold. No matter what people say, and I've had various discussions with people where they are like either pro-gold or against gold. Gold is a very strong commodity. It makes, you know, countries run properly at times. They're valued against gold. Gold is great in turmoil situations more than otherwise. Think of it as a hedge or a buffer for your investments. Some people like to keep physical gold at home. It increases over value. If you look up right now online, you'd be amazed at how much the value of gold has grown even in the last three to four years. The fun fact about gold is that it's one of those things that you can say in a fun way, that, hey, I'm investing in a um, cosmic commodity. What do I mean by that? Gold does not come from Earth. It's born out of stars. When stars explode, go into a stage called supernova, and uh, sort of my, my sort of hobby about the cosmos is kicking in, so I'm getting geeky from within. But when it explodes and then the, the, those gases come back together to form a planet, that's when gold is created through stars exploding. So basically you're investing in a foreign, you know, UFO-based kind of commodity, basically. Gold is great. Gold, there's nothing wrong with gold. Don't bank on it as the only moneymaker for you. Use it as a hedge. Use it as a buffer in portfolios. For example, our portfolios at Wide, they have a bit of gold in them based on your risk level. There's stocks in it. Should we have compliant uh, stocks that we invest in? And Sukuk, Islamic bonds. So you're getting a bucket of stocks, bucket of bonds as well, and then a bucket of gold. So gold is definitely something you should not shy away from, but don't bank on it. That will always work for you. It's a long-term play with gold. Well, Saad, uh, thank you so much. You, you've been very, very resourceful and informative and, and, and wise in, in the way you approach finance. So I thank you for helping us tap into your reservoir of knowledge on finance. And I'm going to now hand it back off to Iman uh, because there are many questions we have from our viewing audience. So thank you thank for you so much. this thank conversation. You. Absolutely. I never thought that during Ramadan, we would be allowed to talk about dating so much, but I, I, <laughs> I, I try to keep it halal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate the, the sharing of all of this stuff. And I'm going to have to send you my portfolio after, after this call. It, it's empty, but inshallah with this, we can, we can all learn we'll a bit. But, um, we, we are getting quite a, quite a few questions in our chat and, and, you know, let's, let's start with kind of the, the bigger scale, you know, for, for many, Many of us, you know, some were buying our first house, some are responsible for, for mortgage payments. What is the housing market, you know, looking like? I, I was speaking to a friend earlier and, and talking about how on the TikTok app, it seems that everyone has become a finance guru now saying that you can buy a house with this kind of money or use this or that. Um, I know we should cite our sources and vet our sources, but w coming from a finance guy, what do you, what do you think that we are to expect? Um, well, first of all, I'll say your source should always be reputable. Just like you said, Imam, that anyone and everyone's becoming a finance guru. Well, the funny thing with that is at some point they will be right. Why? Because if you keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again, at some point you will hit the nail with it. Just like these sort of cryptocurrency crazies out there. I have nothing against it, against it, but a lot of people talk about cryptocurrency a lot, yet they don't know jack about it. I didn't know that much about it until 2014. It was introduced in 2013. Um, but, but the fact is that you need to do your homework properly. What are we looking at from a real estate point of view? Interest rates are low. So people are tempted, even a lot of my clients that are now kind of investing more in real estate because they're finding lower interest rates to be able to afford property with the hope of renting it out or saying, hey, I might, like I mentioned earlier in my, about my own experience, you remortgage, find out if you can remortgage at a lower interest rate. Maybe you might save some money there on your uh, monthly payments for your mortgage or maybe you might be able to pay your home sooner as well. That's great to get over that debt of owning a home is like absolutely amazing. It takes a long time to do that. Um, are we seeing a surge in people buying homes? 
I don't know about that because I don't track it. What I am seeing is a lot of my clients are in a position, the high net worth clients that I work with, where they're taking advantage of low interest rate and actually paying off their homes now. They're like, you know what, I'll take some money out, uh, maybe for my savings or my retirement account because I can, I've reached that age and I'll pay off my, my mortgage basically. Is it advised by everyone? No, everybody's in a different situation, everyone works differently. But the fact that we are in historical low interest rate environment, you should be at least shopping around to take advantage of that to see, hey, okay, so what's my best option? I'm a homeowner, I have some cash, am I able to invest it in, in another home perhaps? Or should I pay off my debt or find a lower interest rate as well that I can take advantage of? There's definitely a lot of hype about it right now and people are definitely picking brain of the local mortgage broker um, or the person that you bought the home with that, that finance your home uh, to find out what your best options are. So what, I, what I'm gaining from this is that it seems that most people have or there are there is a capacity to have you know money in in different kind of uh, buckets or pockets of, of space you know people have their savings people have their retirement people have all sorts of different funds but what are your thoughts on life insurance as an investment stra strategy a uh, whole versus term <laughs> that's a good question um, well first of all i specialize in the sharia compliance space um, i come from a conventional investing background I've never done life insurance myself. I had to study it for my investment exams. It was very dry, but a lot of advisors, just so that you guys know, make a ton of money on selling life insurance. Uh, from a Sharia compliant point of view, there are gray areas there. Some say it's not halal just because of your money is fixed in a certain amount of rate of return that you'll get. But insurance just means you, you're basically abiding with the law of the land as well, right? That, that's fact of life. Um, whole versus variable or life insurance. It just depends the rate of return you will get at an older age or when you pass away, what is your family going to get? Um, variable life insurance is something a lot of people sometimes go for because the return can be based on however the market is performing at that time. When you pass away, I believe it goes down to up to two life terms. So you, the spouse, and the kids basically that can get it. Um, life insurance is, is a good protective measure should something happen to you. Um, and of course, if that is something money-wise you're able to afford because they're very low payments that you pay for them, do look into it. I can't comment between the whole and variable or, or others personally. Um, and there's not an endorsement, but um, I think New York Life is great at this. They specialize in it. Uh, Northwestern is good at it as well, a mutual. Um, so you should shop around with some of their people because they specialize in providing insurance. Always look at one thing. There's a term called rider literally how much fee are you going to pay on that life insurance as well? So a lot of people don't even think about that, but always think about if you're getting a service from someone, how much is it going to cost you? So even with your insurance policy that you're looking to get into, find out how much, how much fee is someone going to charge you? How much money someone's making from you? What are the clauses to break that life insurance if you have to? Because a lot of times people set up a life insurance and later on realize, oh, I made a mistake. I don't need this right now. I need to get out of it and then you're logged into it, or you have to pay a substantial amount of money to break that insurance as well. So be very wary of that. Okay. And, and for those of us, you know, who, who might not have any debt at this time, um, if one has no debt, an emergency savings account for several months and a cushion to invest, what kind of investment recommendations do you have for the mid, you know, to long term um, range, mid being about two to three years and long term being maybe 15 to 20 years? Absolutely. That's a great question. So short term investing two to three years, probably try to avoid investing too much in stocks as such, because stocks are volatile, unless you go for dividend paying stocks, stocks that give you an income. Companies like Apple, Google and others, for example, when they make a profit, they share a small portion with you. Uh, or like ExxonMobil, for example, one of the highest dividend paying stocks out there, surprisingly over 7% just on dividend alone, to my knowledge. So you can do multiple things. You can do fixed investments like real estate. And always remember, a lot of people like to jump on real estate investing, but they don't realize that you're locking your money in. It's not like stock market investing, like or investing with a individual investment account with Wahid, where we have over 220 stocks in our ETF for our clients um, that they can liquidate whenever they want without restrictions or penalties. If you're invested in real estate and you need access to that money, you have to put that real estate on the market. You have to sell it, and then you're going to get some money out of it. So 
A, where you're investing definitely does matter, but B, how quickly you can get access to your investments. So if you're a young person, no debt between medium and long term, go for a bit of everything. Go for some stocks, um, buy funds. I'm a big proponent of index funds. Why? Because they track the entire length and breadth of the market. What do, I, what do I mean by an index? Like the S&P 500. 500 largest companies traded on the stock market. If you can find a fund that mimics it, we created one at Wired. It's called Halal, H-L-A-L. -L. That's the ticker symbol of it. So that has about 220 stocks in it that people can directly invest in and it's taken care of for you. So no debt means definitely go for, uh, for funds. Mm -hmm. They're far better than individual and, and, and stocks. So yeah. Perfect. No, no, sorry, sorry, you were going. I, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but no, 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 I'm, please. I'm a bit curious also. I know that we're getting quite a few questions on this as well, that you, you're mentioning, you know, the, the Sharia compliant uh, aspect of, of Wahid Invest. And if you don't mind to just briefly, you know, share with us, are there major differences in portfolio growth when investing in Sharia compliant stocks versus EFTs versus normal ones? Sure. The biggest difference is that through Sharia compliant stocks, in a nutshell, you're investing in businesses that are permissible by Islamic behavior in a nutshell. What should you not be investing is what we avoid, like bank stocks, insurance stocks, alcohol stocks, tobacco stocks, and other businesses that are activities that are not permissible for Muslims to indulge in. Why should you make money from it? For example, alcohol is actually considered a recession-proof stock. When economies are doing great, People that drink will go into bars and clubs and they'll get drunk. When the economy is doing really poor, they're depressed, they'll still go into bars and clubs and get drunk, for example. So regardless, you could make money in that, but we're not allowed to. So the biggest difference in your return will be based on how the economy is doing in selective sectors. If banking uh, sector is doing really well, you may not make money from that because you're investing in Sharia compliant funds. Usually the rate of return is slightly off, maybe by one to 2%, maybe at 3% at most, depending on who you're investing with and what kind of Sharia compliant stock someone is investing in for you. Are they individual stocks or are they funds, which is a better approach to take? And, and with uh, many of our viewers, I know, you know, even myself, I'm curious about this. Many of us are, you know, young, younger adults. We are, you know, on the brink of graduating or beginning a life or, you know, buying our first home or things like that. And this coronavirus pandemic has certainly put, you know, a wrench in, in what we kind of assumed our plans to be and our finances to look like. So as someone um, who is well versed in, in kind of the volatility and the roller coaster of finances during this time, I'm curious to know what advice you would have for the, the younger generation. I, I know you touched on it a bit earlier, but, but advice in, in wise saving, wise spending, what it is that we need to be doing now to prepare ourselves. Um, the best we can. Uh, absolutely. It's definitely interesting times for the, even uh, my wife's cousin is supposed to graduate on May 23rd. She's going to have a virtual graduation, which is unheard of. So um, interesting times means expect the unexpected. That's how you should prepare for it. A lot of people that are graduating now looking for work, you may have an opportunity, you may not. So how are you going to maintain and manage that? Don't let the emotions get the best of you because that can happen. Um, that, oh, I've invested my money, but it's not doing too well. Well, eventually it will work out because it always does. You have to be patient. So the key is be patient, stick to your goals, do diversify your options of income. Don't just always rely on one prospect of income. We live in a gig economy, as I mentioned earlier. You have a day job, make sure you're taking advantage of your 401k from your employer. You're maxing it out so you get your match as well. Um, do your satellite investing as well. Uh, where you're investing through a third platform like Wired or any other, for instance, mm -hmm. spreading out your options. But those that are fresh grass, those that are young, definitely challenging times, but hopefully it will not last forever. Keep your options open. Take advantage to learn and educate yourself. The stock market is an interesting place. The U New York Stock Exchange has been around for over 140 years. It will stay beyond our lifetime as well. Uh, and money is what makes the world go round go round as well. The US economy will never go down to zero. It cannot cease to exist. That will not happen. That's like saying, if I have an iPhone, I cannot use it anymore. My Verizon service will stop working. Um, companies like Apple, which shut down and Google, that's not going to happen tomorrow. So fear makes us do irrational things. And we have to do our best to stay rational 
in this time and age. So you're a young individual, you know, stay fixated, stay focused on the goal that you want to achieve and just know that, you know, this is not going to last forever. Is it ever too early to start reaching out to companies, you know, organizations like Wahid Invest? Do, do we need to be, you know, millionaires, billionaires to, to have you to get an appointment or, or well, is it <laughs> um, No, not really at all. I, I like to make myself feel important by saying I work with clients that have a net worth of million or more, but no, that's not true. Um, I was taught to say that at Morgan Stanley because they like to make themselves feel special and important. But no, the funny thing is Wahid Invest was created for Muslims by Muslims. The CEO had a funny conversation with a cab driver in New York after finishing his day job where the cab driver said, I have $30,000 in savings. I'm looking to invest in Apple stock because my local imam said that Apple is a halal stock. And it made Junaid worry a little bit by thinking that, hey, wait a minute, what's the guarantee that Apple cannot be the future AOL? Some of us who remember AOL does not exist anymore. So he created the concept of what a Sharia compliant investment online platform could be like that anyone with as little as $100 can start investing their money in a diversified portfolio. So you don't even need an appointment. I've got a team that works. You just go online, follow the process. It's very simple and easy to follow. Ask you a bunch of questions. You're given advice based on that, which portfolio to invest in. You can choose any that you like, again, based on your risk level. Everyone has their own level of risk. What are you comfortable with? And then I have a team that'll be more than happy to help people with that as well. Wonderful, wonderful. And so our final question goes back to the, the scary word of 401k, um, which I know for many of us is a, is a hot topic right now. And so our question is, what are your thoughts on putting 100% of one's 401k into a growth index fund or a QQQ? Is that an acceptable, acceptable diversification in our 401k? So... QQQ is like the ticker symbol of one of the funds out there. So growth index, index fund is great. You just sold me on index fund right there. If you're investing in an index fund, you should be just fine over time because you are literally matching your performance to how the economy is doing. If the economy is doing well, you'll do fine. If they're not doing well, you won't do fine. 401k is the best thing to have in America. So think of it this way, guys. There are two important things, and this is food for thought towards the end. There are two things that people invest in America the most. Number one is real estate, because we all need a roof to live under. And number two is your retirement account. Any company and every company almost offers a 401k, 403b, 457b. They're all fancy terms for the same thing, pretty much. As long as you're going for an index fund, that is the ideal approach to take, because that by default is already diversifying your investment options. As you get older, you need to revisit that. Earlier when the question was raised that, you know, should you rebalance or change your 401k? With age and time, you need to be doing that. But while you're younger, if you're capable of taking risks, go for it. Higher the risk, higher the reward eventually. That does work, but when you're in your 50s or 60s, you better not be taking that much risk. It's yeah. not gonna go in your favor. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zarif. You you have definitely, um, I, feel like, uh, I feel like I'm ready, I'm ready to go. Yeah, maybe after quarantine, you show up at the stock exchange and, and, and make it happen. But thank you so much for, for informing so many of us on, on all of this topic. Um, for our viewers, um, you know, please keep the questions coming. If you have any concerns at all, um, you are welcome to email us at hello at mpac.org and we'll be happy to um, answer any of your questions at any time. Um, Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Saad. It was very, very helpful. And hope we'll have you again in the near future. Uh, look forward to it. Thank you again. Everyone Ramadan. be safe. Ramadan. 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 Thank you. Salaam.